Good morning. Welcome to Global Health World. Good morning, if everyone can take their seats. My name is Tom Quinn. I'm the director of the Center for Global Health at Johns Hopkins and uh, uh, on the CUGH board. And I want to wish everyone here today a very happy Mother's Day. Uh, you know you're all very dedicated to global health when on Mother's Day, here we are sitting at 10 a.m. on a beautiful Sunday. Uh, and I, I want to thank you all for, for being here for this next very exciting debate. As you heard yesterday, this is a new introduction to our uh, CUGH annual meeting. And yesterday's debate was just truly outstanding, and I look forward to a uh, a repeat of an outstanding debate this morning. But as, as we did yesterday, I'm going to do a bit of a, a, a pre-quiz, um, and it's about the motion. So the motion that we're going to debate, it, it sort of picks up on uh, Dr. Piat's uh, presentation and the new challenges that we're facing in global health today. The motion is the next dollar in global health should be in demand, not supply. So if I could just have a show of hands, not whether you're in favor or against that motion, but whether you understand that motion. <laughs> so, so raise your hand. Yeah. If you understand that motion, raise your hand. Yeah, I, that's what I thought. OK. Actually, there was a debate about the wording of this motion among the organizers. Uh, you know, should it be cash on delivery? Should the next dollar? Of course we want dollars. We demand dollars for global health. I mean, so, so it's the way that it was phrased that uh, created a little bit of uh, uh, uncertainty as to what we were really uh, meaning. And so I wanted to take a minute, and then I'm going to introduce our debaters. So if we're talking about demand side, as Peter so eloquently brought up, demand side is where the funding that's going from global health aid uh, should be focused on the people in the households and getting them educated, transported, making them uh, readily taking up uh, the services that are present within a health service uh, within a country. I hope I'm stating the pro on that. Now, on the con side, how do you do that unless you invest in infrastructure and that the health aid that's coming in that goes to the ministries of health, uh, to the country, are to build the clinics to help support the education of the doctors, to get the doctors to the clinics, to get the medical supplies to the clinic. Vishnu, I hope I'm, I'm describing the, the con side. That, that, that would be the side that he would be taking. You really can't do one without the other, and I'm sure you're all thinking that. But we're talking about Global Health 2.0. We've been spending money on both of these areas of the, of the argument, I guess, uh, but maybe more on one side than on another side. If you were head of U.S. aid or you were uh, head of uh, some other international agency that gives out supply uh, funding, health aid funding, do you give it to the supply side or do you give it to the demand side? That's what we're going to argue. So now we'll do the second pop quiz here. Having described it, and I may be off a little bit, we'll learn more from our debaters. How many of you feel that the next dollar in global health should be in the demand side rather than the supply side? Raise your hand if you're in favor of that statement. OK. How many of you feel it should be on the supply side rather than the demand side? OK. It it's actually looks pretty even. So we're going to have a good debate on this. Let me introduce our, our speakers today. 
So all, taking the pro side uh, is Amanda Glassman, who is the Director of Global Health Policy and a Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Development, leading work on priority setting, resource allocation, value for money in global health with a particular interest in vaccination programs. She has 20 years of experience working in the health and social protection policy and programs in Latin America and elsewhere in the developing world. Prior to her current position, Amanda was principal technical lead for health at the Inter-American Development Bank, where she led health economics and financing knowledge products and policy dialogue with member countries designed with results-based grants program, Salud Miso America 2015, and served as a team leader for conditional cash transfer programs in Mexico's uh, opportunities and uh, Colombia's uh, families in action. Prior to her current position, she worked as Deputy Director of the Global Health Financing Initiative at the Brookings Institute and carried out policy research on aid effectiveness and domestic financing issues in the health sector in low-income countries. Taking the con side uh, of this debate, uh, is Jisnu Das. Jisnu Das is the lead economist in Development Research Group, Human Development and uh, Public Services team at the World Bank and is a visiting fellow at the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi. Jisnu's work is focused on the delivery of basic services, particularly health and education. He's worked on the quality of healthcare, mental health, information and health and education markets, child learning, test scores, and determinants of trust. He's the recipient of multiple awards, including um, the um, uh, Research Academy Award from the World Bank uh, just this past year. I want to welcome both of our debaters this morning. And without further ado, Amanda Glassman. Okay, thank you very much. Happy Mother's Day to everyone. Um, so the next dollar for global health should be in demand and not supply. Some assumptions about this motion that I'll be making. First, I'll assume that the main purpose of global health funding or development assistance for health is to improve people's health status particularly that of the poor. Second, I understand demand as people and households themselves, the one whose health status we as a community are seeking to improve. And so I understand our motion as, and will argue that it makes sense to transfer the next dollar to people and households themselves, the demand side, rather than putting another dollar through the supply side, the health ministry, the clinic, the clinician. So I'll make three points. First, health care is not the only determinant of health status. We all know this well, and sometimes it's not the most important. Second, that the quality and efficiency of health care in many countries is so poor that the next dollar would produce more health if it were in people's hands themselves. And third, even if health care supply were perfectly efficient, Behaviors on the demand side considerably reduce its effectiveness in health improvement, and so the next dollar could usefully be spent in modifying these counterproductive behaviors. So let's take the first point. Healthcare is not only one determinant of health status. So healthcare as conventionally delivered may explain about half of the declines in premature disability and death in high income countries, according to work by David Cutler. And we just don't have a great estimate of the role of healthcare and technologies in mortality and morbidity decline in developing countries. We don't know how important access to healthcare and technologies is versus other factors, economic growth, education, clean water, environmental influences, personal behavior, et cetera. So, you know, the Lancet Commission, Global Health 2035, they had to rely on a very old study that had to assume a 2% annual decline in under five mortality that was related to technology. That was about as good as it got. So second, so the point of this is that there's space to invest on the demand side to improve healthcare, given that the contribution of care and technology doesn't tell us the whole story. 
Second, on the issue of quality and efficiency of healthcare in many countries. Here I have Jishnu's own work, thankfully, to rely on. <laughs> so we don't know whether the huge gains in access to medical providers and facilities over the past 25 years has translated into an increase in the quality and effectiveness of care. Jishnu's own work shows that the majority of providers in India, Indonesia, and Tanzania do not know or practice basic essential procedures for common diseases, and that in the poorest areas, these deficiencies are even more pronounced. I encourage you to read his work. It's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> and while pay for performance on the supply side is often touted as the solution to these problems and is in fact practiced very often by the World Bank through the Health Results Innovation Trust Fund, only one of the developing country studies published so far reports on health impact. That one study by John Peabody and his colleagues in the Philippines found an effect on self-reported health outcomes only and no effect on directly observed health outcomes. And perhaps most damning, a recent systematic review of the health impact of donor investments in global health that was published in Health Policy and Planning last year concludes, quote, we found few studies that adequately demonstrate the full process by which external funding has been translated into health impact. So why is this problematic? Because there are lots of other things going on in this space besides healthcare. Only two studies in this systematic review use control studies designs. And only one reported health impact. You probably know it. It's the study by Ben David that looks at PEPFAR's impact on adult mortality. 15 years of global health funding, and this is what we have. Troubling. But on the other hand, cash transfer programs that give cash directly to individuals and households and that have been widely supported also by the World Bank and other banks have shown consistently positive and sometimes very large effects on health and nutrition status, have been rigorously evaluated and published in the peer-reviewed literature. In Brazil, Bolsa Familia led to a decline in infant mortality of 9% and post-neonatal mortality by 24%, and this is already in a fairly wealthy setting. In Mexico, Oportunidades beneficiaries are found to be better nourished, less likelihood of low birth weight, less over 65 mortality, less HSV2, less anemia. These are rigorous, controlled studies. And these programs are working even in the poorest, most fragile, most conflict-affected places in the world. There are about 44 programs worldwide. We just ran an event at CGD where the results of an RCT in a large-scale, unconditional child cash transfer program in Zambia run by the government was being discussed. After two years, diarrhea incidents dropped by 25% among beneficiaries compared to non-beneficiaries. This is unconditional. Just give very poor families the money. They know how to use it. In Malawi, a program transferred cash to girls to attend school, 60% lower HIV incidence. Show me the supply side investment that generates similar results. So finally, even if healthcare supply were great, perfectly efficient, the behavior that we have, that all of us have on the household side reduces the effectiveness of care in improvement. So for the next dollar, and let's assume that most of the dollars we've already spent really have been on the supply side. Care seeking, follow up, adherence, risk behaviors, inappropriate demand for something like antibiotics, our artemisinin and only malaria treatments, all of these things could be influenced by demand side investments. You all know about the treatment cascade uh, in HIV treatment. You know, there, there are some studies that found that of those that are diagnosed with HIV, only half are linked to care. Of those linked to care, only half are retained on ART. Surely small-scale financial incentives, reminders, and other kinds of demand-side interventions could really improve outcomes. There are new studies that actually enroll people in lotteries if they say HIV-free, or if they fumigate their house for chagas-spreading bugs, and they're having great results. So for all these reasons, the next dollar should go to demand, to people themselves, rather than supply. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Vishnu, it is now your turn. Please welcome Vishnu Das to the podium.
Oh, yeah. uh, can they please put up his slides? Can we have the slides, please? Thank you for being here. Uh, this is going to be hard. I'm going in with three strikes against me. Um, so we were first threatened with how good yesterday's debate was, and we better uh, you know, hold up to that. And then uh, we heard these beautiful arguments for why the, how the conchite should be argued, and of course I'm going to make none of them. Uh, and then today is Mother's Day, so I have a wife at home. <laughs> Uh, who's not very, very happy about ours being here. Uh, but uh, I want to take this, uh, take this debate to, to, to the following steps, which is I'm an economist by training. And as economists, one of the things that's ingrained in our training and in the work we do is enormous respect for the choices that people make whether they're poor, whether they're illiterate, whether they're in a country where nothing works, we always respect their choices. Right? So for, for example, when I see that people forego the opportunity to go to a public clinic that's free and go to a private provider who's untrained, the question for me is not why are people making these bad choices? My natural assumption is that they're making the best choice that they can. And a lot of my work has gone to show that that's actually true. Right? So for us, the bar for thinking about the supply side is exceptionally high because we are always looking for where is it that income alone will not cut it, right? The answer to this, as usually happens, comes from women. And the two women that I want to talk about today are, first of all, this woman, and this is Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale during the Crimean War noticed the following. Right? In 1854, she plotted out this fantastic figure that showed how the troops died. Right? The gray part of the figure is non-death wounds, non-fatalities, non, uh, fatalities that did not relate to battle wounds or battle. Right? They were primarily people who died, most of the soldiers died because of bad sanitation, bad uh, medical care, and bad hygiene. Right? What people don't know about Florence Nightingale was she was so struck by her results in Crimea that she then went to India and she set up the first Indian Sanitary Commission. Right? What the Sanitary Commission decided was that they were going to put in sanitary measures in the cantonments where the soldiers were. Right? If you look at that picture, what happened was pretty dramatic. Mortality remained the same almost until about 1900, and then it dropped equally dramatically as in cantonment after cantonment sanitation measures were put in. Right? That's not just, just in India. In the US, between 1900 and 1920, child mortality drops dramatically as clean water comes into municipalities. And if you look across the world at female versus male mortality, for instance, where are the major drops? They're all between 1900 and 1920 in all the OECD countries as sanitation and clean water comes in. Right? So what was the way out? The way out was think big. Right? The question, the problem that global health has had is we're always thinking small. Right? And one of the major lessons we have learned from the past is it's public goods, it's the goods that people cannot provide on their own that governments need to provide, and that's where the biggest bang for the buck is. The second woman is somebody who's a lot less known. It's a woman called, who, who was called Parveen Rahman, and she was shot down in Karachi uh, about a year back. I had the privilege to meet and work with her uh, just before her assassination, and she was the head of the Orangi pilot project. Orangi is a big slum in Karachi with the population of Amsterdam. And Orangi was the site where Akhtar Hamid Khan, around the 1980s, showed what people can do with a little bit of help, with a little bit of money, in building sanitation systems. Here's this quote. In 1980, we formed an organization called OPP to work with one of these communities. And this is, this is 1980, was home to about one million working class people. Sanitation was their most urgent need. Above healthcare, schools and jobs, they wanted the government to install a modern sewage system. OPP set about helping them. 17 years later, virtually every home in Orangi has a poor flush toilet connected to an underground sewage line, all paid for residents. Right? 
That was one of the major lessons from the OECD countries. It's sanitation, it's clean water, it's the big investments in public health that drive mortality changes. We are thinking small, and this is the major issue that I have with Amanda's talk. This is small talk, right? Why is it small talk? If you fast forward 180 years almost, 150 years, Today, we have exactly the same problem in most low-income countries. This is work that Dean Spears has been doing uh, at Princeton, and it shows on the horizontal axis the fraction of households in a country which defecate openly without a latrine or toilet. India is at about 70%. We have, we have way more mobile phones than toilets. And the graph shows incredibly that Places that have invested in clean water, sanitation, have dramatically increased the heights of children. Right? That's been one of the big drivers, these big investments has one of been, been one of the big drivers of increasing height, which we all know relates very strongly to wages and better life outcomes. I would also argue that we're acting small. Right? We're acting small because we are not taking children's lives seriously enough. This is Pakistan in 2005 after the earthquake. For a couple of months I was in the villages trying to see what was going on and this was December. The houses were not yet ready. People were living in conditions like that. And about four years later my colleague Tahir Andrabi and I went back and we interviewed and surveyed about 5,000 households. What did we find? We found that nearly all household outcomes and child and adult outcomes were back to normal. The big, big problem was children. Right? If you look at this picture, which just shows height for age, any child between zero and three as a result of the earthquake suffered a huge insult to the heights, almost to the tune of one standard deviation, which is almost, you know, which is a huge, huge number in this literature, and they're unlikely to recover through their lives. Right? The same thing happened with their test scores, but here's the most interesting thing. Children whose mothers had some education were fully protected against losses in test scores. Children whose mothers had some education were no different in height insults, right? So if you want to think about what are the non-health determinants of health, the one thing that the current literature is starting to show is that biological shocks that happen in early childhood are very, very difficult to take care of just with income or with other non-health non, uh, determinants. Finally, I think we are understanding small, right? And I think we're understanding small because of the following reason. This is some work that I did on what's called the sex ratio of mortality, which is what's the rate at which women died relative to men. And this is all the OECD countries. So this is France, Sweden, Belgium, England, and Wales. And you don't need to stare at it too much to see you know, that big blue line with very similar patterns across countries. That's pretty much the sex ratio of mortality today in most high income countries. You know, boys die way more than women girls between 18 and 21, apparently they have a lot of uh, um, testosterone, uh, then it kind of drops off and then it kind of stabilizes with a peak around the 19, uh, around 60s. Can we make the same figure for low income countries? Well, seemingly yes, because the WHO will release all these data on life tables. But fortunately, if we had data that we had downloaded at two different points in time, before the revised version and after the revised version, and when you plot these two things, nothing makes sense, right? Everything changes, okay? So you have to realize that the third big problem that we have is we're understanding small because there's been insufficient global investment in data, learning, and knowledge, right? So there are three things that I'd like you to take away is, you know, we are thinking small, we are acting small, and our understanding is very small, right? The way Amanda talks about the empirical research, it compares one small thing with another small thing. Let's give cash versus let's give something else, right? What I want to think about is, well, we know from the OECD experience that what really mattered was big. It was the big public health interventions, the sewage lines, the clean water to the municipalities that drove all the reductions, remember antibiotics don't enter the scene until the 1930s, but by then most of the reductions in mortality in childhood have already happened. Right? Somewhere along the line, we lost the plot. We lost the plot to say, when we're talking about government interventions, we have to th think about those interventions that households cannot do themselves. 
And that's always going to be the interventions that have a public good aspect to that, that you cannot, cannot reap all the benefits from when you make it yourself. Right? So let me conclude there. I think the key issue that I want to think about is you know, global health is just too big to be driven by small talk. Thank you. Thank you, Vishnu. Amanda, you have three minutes okay. for a rebuttal. Small okay. and big. Small. OK. Uh, so Vishnu has cleverly redefined the supply side to be every other function of government. We don't disagree. But I would ask you, how do we get to those public goods of sewage and universal education and things like that when the situation of governance is so poor that the people who are most affected don't have much political voice? And cash transfers themselves have an empowering effect on both the efficiency and responsiveness of public services and potentially on local government. So I think the way to get there could still be through cash transfers without missing the big picture that investing in other, in public goods like sewage are incredibly important. And second, you know, do we live in a world where it's really easy to reallocate from something called global health to something called water and sanitation? Politically speaking, there's, so there's the desirable, but there's reality, and the reality is that it's hard to transfer those monies in our institutions away from one sector to another. And that's why I focus on the small choice, because that's the policy choice that we really face, and that someone sitting in the World Bank, a TTL, could take, even though they've been allocated health money, and their sector manager has given them a, a project in a country. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Vishnu, do you have uh, three minutes for rebuttal to Amanda's rebuttal? <laughs> she just made my point, right? Uh. So, do I? You, 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 may. you, you, you may. may. You can amplify. Oh, on okay. That. Uh, oh, so, Amanda was doing the real politic thing, right? I mean, this is the, the inside the beltway, this is pretty common, which is where you say, ooh, I lost the. The, the desirability argument, let's be moving into implementation, right? And that, I think, is the problem. The problem is this, which is whenever we see poor government services, our first instinct is to give up, right? And we have been giving up for too long. And the big, big lesson we have learned from giving up is there are some things that the private sector cannot do not because it can't do it, but because a government that cannot govern its own systems cannot regulate the private system when it comes in. And we have seen this happen in country after country after country, right? So my argument on this is twofold, right? Which is, you know, there's always a standard argument in the US about, oh, one party says our schools suck, we should shut them down and move into charters. And another group says our schools suck, we should give them more money. Right? And that's never going to be an empirically res you know, resolvable discussion because we're never going to see the counterfactual of what happens when we give, give, give big money and give big support until we try it out. Right? So in fact, Amanda, in my, in my papers, and you refer to them fairly often, part of our whole agenda has been to say that global health has moved to this curative agenda and this small agenda. And the conclusion always says, look, quality is really poor, but quality may be really poor just because People are poor, and we should make them richer. Where the government should really focus is on these big public goods, right? So I am not willing to take the stance of giving up on the government on what is its primary responsibility, and I will fight tooth and nail to make sure that that happens. Well, I think that was all very clear. I now understand the motion. <laughs> so now we open it up to the audience. Uh, does uh, anyone uh, wish to come to the microphone uh, and either raise a point in favor of the motion uh, or against the motion? Remember, we're talking about the next dollar. Where should the investment go? 
And I have one individual at the microphone. Please introduce yourself and address it to one of the two. And I'm from India. And I am for the motion, and I would like to say three points. The first is, we often talk about behaviors only in the context of harmful behaviors. Health-seeking and health utilization behaviors is perhaps the most important. You can keep giving the supply side big bucks. If people are not going to utilize it, it's of no use. The second point I'd like to make is, India thought big when it came to sanitation. It thought really big. It put trillions of dollars into constructing individual toilets and then realized that only 10% of the population was actually using those toilets. So where did the money go? It went into construction, it went into pits, but it didn't go into changing behaviors for using those toilets. The third point I would like to make, sir, is when it comes to malnutrition in children in India, you have an equal number of malnourished, malnourished children in the wealthiest percentile of families, which indicates it's not just poverty, it's behaviors, it's feeding behaviors that is really driving this whole thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Amanda, I don't think you need to respond to that, but Vishnu, do you have a, any comment to <laughs> counter that at all? Sure. Um, yeah. So, so, so uh, we have a, in India, we have a saying, never let the evidence stand in the way of your argument. I uh, <laughs> don't have much more to say to that, right? So three things. You know, one, one, is, one is that actually if you look at the budget spending in India over the last 30 years, we spend about 1% of our health budget on preventive and promotive health and spend about 90%, 95% on curative health. So we're not investing too much in sanitation. Second, uh, what's happened with all the stuff that we did, it's working, right? So there's this really nice paper, there's this, you know, you probably know about this program called the Nirmal Gram Puruskar, which is an award given to household, to villages that, uh, that, that, that get to total sanitation, right? I mean, nobody's defecating in the open. And there's a paper, very nice paper, looking at the reductions, how that has had a massive reduction in, in, in uh, child malnutrition. The third point, uh, uh, that was raised was what about household behaviors, right? I want to take you back a while to 1920. Uh, so the Rockefeller Foundation, right? And, and the Rockefeller Foundation has stopped doing this anymore. Uh, it was in Central America around Pan uh, Panama that they started doing this massive sanitation project. And the first thing they realized is they built the toilets, but nobody was used them, mm -hmm. right? Took them 20 years, but they stuck with it. Right? It was introduced in the school curriculums, it was introduced, and it, the change came from children. Yeah. It was the children who said, you know, look, I don't feel comfortable going to my school and telling my friends that my parents still don't use the toilet, right? Those changes came, and in 25 years, everybody in Panama was using a toilet, right? So we have given up. I mean, our thinking small is what can we do in six months? What can we do with we one small program versus another? You know, go back to thinking big. In, in all fairness, I'll give Amanda one uh, retort. No, I just say, like a small cash transfer could change toilet use really quickly. There you go. <laughs> okay. All right. So I have two people here. Uh, I'm just going to take, uh, make it very short, make your statement, uh, and then I'll take both of them at the same time. You first. Yeah, Jonathan Patz, Wisconsin. Uh, very quickly, I think it's not necessarily big versus small in the argument for investment. I think we're talking about not investing directly into health. As Peter Piat said, most of population health is beyond the health sector. And so I think that both of you are arguing for that. Right. And the second one? Andrew Dickens, uh, University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, it comes to my mind uh, community-based participatory research, community-based participatory evaluation. I'm wondering about community-based participatory sustainability, perhaps. And I'm wondering, uh, perhaps community-focused initiatives could lead the way to more transparent gover government that, in turn, eventually are more community-centered. So I don't know that necessarily governmental as opposed to private-focused 
initiatives means necessarily non-transparency or lack of community-centeredness. Thank you very much. Amanda, do you any comment to these two or Vishnu? I'll give either one of you. And I just want to return to one point Jishnu made at the, at, the, at the top of his talk. He talked about how we shouldn't be paternalistic and how people, we have to respect the choices that people make. And the best way to do that is to enable them to make choices by raising their consumption to a minimum level and to allow them to make the best choices for them. And we've seen that that improves health as well, just coincidentally. So thanks. Great. Thank you. Vishnu, final comment? Oh, yeah. I mean, I completely agree. I think incumbents are very strong determined. Incumbent education are very strong determinants of health. But this is where, I mean, remember that global health, as we were hearing global funding, as we were hearing in the last talk, is a tiny fraction of overall spending on this material. The question is, how are you going to leverage that spending the most, right? And my point is, you're not going to leverage that by increasing incomes in people's countries. That's back to our old agenda of increased growth with redistribution. Right? That's, that's not what you're talking about. What we really need to show is we can do those projects and we can have big impacts. Uh, it's getting late. There's people coming to the microphone now. Uh, but I, I'm getting the high sign. I'm going to have to cut this off because it's uh, uh, into our break time. I really appreciate both of our discussants. I think they did a great job. Now, before anyone leaves for the break, we're going to take a final vote on this motion. I'll reread it. The next dollar in global health should be in demand, the demand side, not the supply side. How many in favor of the motion? Raise your hand. OK. How many against the motion? I think that takes the, yeah, yeah, yeah Vishnu, congratulations. Hey, congratulations, Amanda, as well. Wonderful debate. Thank you. Thank you very much.